So today's dream comes from a 46-year-old woman who uh, works in the environmental field, and she named it Transparent Swan Hatchlings and Bloody Nose. And here's the dream. I'm at the beach with my two sons and a friend of my older son. We are staying in a hotel connected to the beach by a trail. We are walking back from the ocean along a raised compacted sand path through wetlands. There are low fences on each side of the path. My dad is walking ahead of us and tells us to check something out, pointing to the wetland to our right. He says there is a whale and some bluebirds. We look and see some bluebirds hopping around in the grass. We also see a nest of swans. There are several swans just emerging out of their eggs. There are broken eggshells and slimy, transparent baby swans moving and stretching. They are so clear we can almost see right through them. My older son wants to see them better and gets closer. He walks over the fence and right into the nest. He steps on one of the baby swans and I think he may have killed it. It turns out he was stepping on a transparent, slimy fish that is also in the nest, a large, transparent koi. He steps on it, but it is only on the edge of its tail and the fish is not harmed. But I am really mad. I tell him it is not okay. He shrugs it off, acting like it is not a big deal. I start to yell, telling him it is a big deal, that it is illegal and that he could get arrested for trampling on wildlife so carelessly. Other people are around and hear my yelling. They are starting to stare. My son is getting upset and embarrassed, but he still shows no sign of regret. He tells me to stop yelling. I get so mad, I punch him in the nose. Snot and blood run down his face. The tension is released and my anger subsides and is replaced with shock and regret that I punched him. And she notes, my work is environmental and I realized just recently how much earth grief I am holding in, repressing. I am actively working to hold this grief and forgiveness for all we have done to Mother Earth in my heart, to feel the grief. This dream made me realize how much anger is mixed in with this grief and how this anger is not helping me and is only leading to destructive, violent thoughts or behaviors. <sighs> the main feelings in the dream were awe and wonder as she saw the swan hatchlings and then overwhelming anger at her son, then shock and regret for her violent behavior. She says, my two sons are the ages they currently are, 12 and 14. My older son is independent, musical, creative, sometimes impulsive, kind, and responsible. My younger son is creative, smart, driven to work the things he loves, sensitive, cares deeply about others, and is a rule follower. I live in the mountains, but the coast shows up frequently in my dreams as a setting. I love water and visiting coastal areas. I am working on a project in a coastal area where we are discussing sea level rise and storm surge and their impact on the landscape. Climate change is undeniable in coastal communities. Well, I'm going to jump right in. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> to me, this is a dream about compensation. And the reason okay. I say that is that when the ego has a particularly one-sided conscious orientation, which let's say is the preciousness of all natural life, the preciousness of wildlife, of nesting areas, that at the moment where that level of intense position constellates, its opposite also constellates somewhere in the unconscious, which is the indifferent, cavalier, childlike, awkward, and clumsy relationship to those exact same values. So what we see in the dream is this confluence of the opposites. That is, the dream ego is full of wonder and protective, um, even rage, about the sanctity of nature, that there is also, you know, an unconscious teenage figure inside of her that is just out of curiosity trampling, walking in 
manhandling, mm. sticking fingers in things, moving them around, maybe accidentally crushing, you know, a baby swan, um, with a kind of um, perhaps naive, enthusiastic clumsiness, and that both of those qualities are inside of her, and that right now it's very difficult for her to embrace that young, unskilled, clumsy part of herself, that she wants to subdue it, punch it in the nose, mm-hmm. be aggressive towards her own unskilled handling. And the good news is that the two parts of her meet in the dream. Yes, the dream ego acts out, but there is the beginning of a reconciliation in as much as she realizes that she is mistreating some part of her own psyche that requires a very different response, and that dominating rage is not adequate for her to understand that she is both the protector of the natural environment and also equally as clumsy and injurious as the average person marauding through the natural world. Mm-hmm. And now I shall step aside <laughs> after having put all, put all that out with so much confidence. Yeah. So. No, the, you know, there's something, there's something there. I'm, there's something I can, I'm reaching for that I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to be able to get my hands all the way around it. But, but um, the sun does not injure, first of all, in the end, nothing, maybe it's just slightly injured, but he doesn't, he doesn't wind up killing anything. And as you point out, Joseph, it's not done in any, uh, out of any malice. It's actually done in mm-hmm. a kind of enthusiastic uh, enjoyment of this phenomenon. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember there was this book that I read a number of years ago called The Last Child in the Woods. And it was talking about children's relationship with nature. And we teach kids to be very careful and we say, don't touch, don't touch, don't touch. But, you know, it, it used some of some of the greatest uh, naturalists actually as children did things like hunt, you know, and it's just sort of like being out in, in the in nature. I'm, I'm not I'm not sort of proposing here that, uh, you know, hunting is the, the answer to our ecological crisis. But I think I'm going to something along the lines of what you were talking about, right. which is that there's something very precious here. It's fenced off. It can only be enjoyed from this narrow path. And if we think about that, even taking it out of the context of the environment and just say, what about our relationship to instinctual life in general, Mm -hmm. our own instinctual life? Where is that so fenced off that it can only be enjoyed from a distance? And uh, could we imagine that the spirit of this 14-year-old, let me take a closer look that that's actually the medicinal attitude that one would want to take. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the ego might there's a there's a some kind of rigidity I'm sensing in in the ego. I also want to say mm. just throwing this out there. We, we don't know a lot about you know who her sons are and what their relationship is like right now. This is one of those dreams where if I had the dreamer here, I would explore whether there might be an objective. Uh, uh, real, uh, aspect to this dream is it saying something about her yeah. actual relationship with her actual son is there something about the dynamic between them in the dream that is commenting mm-hmm. on an on a real life waking dynamic as well and i just don't know because i don't have enough information mm-hmm. sure you know what i um noted at the beginning of the dream is that we have the dream ego who is a woman, her two sons, a friend of one of her sons, and her dad. So there are actually five people here, uh, four of whom, I assume the friend of the son is another boy, but um, I think that's a reasonable, uh, at least a path to go down here. And... um, what might be playing out, we call nature Mother Nature, uh, and there's a nest of hatchlings. 
there's a lot of this new birth, tenderness, mothering, nurturing, uh, as opposed to what the dream ego sees as this recklessness uh, by, by the 14-year-old. Uh, he's just curious. So he, he just pops himself over the fence um, and, and isn't especially attentive. And I'm thinking you're, I think you've gotten to it, Joseph, with the idea of the compensatory function of the psyche. And Jung says that that is uh, the key component in every dream, that something about the dream, uh, like balancing a seesaw, uh, will take something that is too much in one direction and present the other and uh, that maybe there is something in this male energy, the three boys and a father, uh, that, that it also serves a purpose. Uh, it turns out it's not a baby swan. Uh, it's a fish. The fish isn't hurt. And I'm also, uh, so no harm was done, but she's mad. She's mad about the attitude. The other thing that I have to say has gripped me is that she lives in the mountains and does coastal work. So there's the, those two opposites of living up high uh, and working down where the water is. Uh, you know, the great mother, the great unconscious. So I think we're all walking around a series of opposites here that the dream presents. Uh, and that at the end, she feels bad about having been herself attacking, which is what she accuses her son of doing. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. her son, you know, uh, so it sort of comes full circle. I'm curious about what the dad is doing there. I'm sorry we don't have any associations to him. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're right, Deb. I mean, the son, what the son does is transgressive. And, the, and yes. that which is true. We, in order to individuate, we usually have to transgress. I'm also really curious about the whale in the wetlands. And I'm noticing, mm -hmm. which of course is an entirely inappropriate place for a whale. And I'm, and I'm noticing that there seems to be an, an echoing of that theme with the fish in the nest, which presumably is still alive because she's worried about it being injured. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, you know, there are, these, there are these new contents, the, 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 what do they call baby swans? Cygnets? Is that what they call them? Uh, these yes, little yes. baby swans <laughs> and the fish, that they're uh, transparent. Mm. They're so... Uh, they're so vulnerable Fra fragile. and fragile, yeah. but it's this kind of new and a little bit gross, you know, it's kind of slimy and bloody, both of them, uh, or at least slimy and, uh, it's a little gross, but it's, it's miraculous and it's, and it's life. And, and the sun just kind of instinctively moves toward it. Um, so, so yeah, but that somehow there's a whale in the wrong place. A whale does not. And a fish in the wrong, wrong place. place. And a fish in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. and, and both of them are, you know, perhaps constrained, you know, like a whale in the wetlands wouldn't be able to swim. And a fish in a nest wouldn't be able to swim either. And, and this boy is trying to break out of the constraints. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that, there's a theme there. I don't know. I mean, I think it's there are so many. The... Yeah, go ahead, Deb. I'm just going to the uh, last part of the dream of all these feelings that come up. Uh, that um, she says, "I am really mad." The the tape fish is not harmed. She's mad. She tells her son it's not okay. He shrugs it off, so he's disdainful. Then she starts yelling at him. 
Then she's embarrassed be- because other people are nearby and hear her yelling. They start to stare. Her son gets upset and embarrassed. Uh, she gets so mad she punches him in the nose, and then the tension is released. Mm-hmm. And my anger subsides and is replaced with shock and regret that I punched him. I am still puzzling over all these feelings of the the tenderness of our dream ego toward the wetlands and bluebirds and the whale and the little swans and everything is very, very precious, uh, it juxtaposed with um, the anger toward her I'm son. Knock you in and, the nose. Uh, and it goes to the interpersonal realm instead of the natural realm. And that it's maybe somehow the dream ego is loving nature in its tenderness and uh, uh, all these wonderful images of whales and so on. But when it comes to an interpersonal relationship that doesn't feel the same way, Mm-hmm. Um, that that's where this anger and embarrassment and regret and I, I'm not quite sure where I'm landing with this. Maybe you guys can help me, but I, it, it's yeah. two very opposite sets of feelings. Yes. I I also think it's it's um it's an interesting task to hold a dream like this because I hear the dreamers great sorrow for Mm -hmm. uh, what we're doing to the planet. And, and it's, it's hard to know. um, Like where that is in the dream. And I think maybe to your point, Deb, although I, I very much, you know, agree with this dreamer that, that there's this, unbelievably tragic thing that we're just doing to the planet every day. I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's too big to take in. Way uh, too big. I wonder if there's something about being with that sadness that uh, the, the shadow side of being so aware of that is something like a power drive or self-righteousness or something. Mm-hmm. And maybe that goes to your your point, Deb, about the um, you know, this kind of very unlikely feeling that arises that she's going to punch her kid in the nose. It must be hard, yeah, to work. You know, I I find that yeah. really moving. How you devote your life, your professional life education, uh, to a love for the planet, for nature, uh, and it is unrequited, which is what we just finished talking about, Mm. that environmental damage continues. Um, There are, you know, all the things we all know about from flooding to fires. and. I wonder if it is really hard to hold going to work every day. Yeah. Uh, to preserve, to do your small part of preserving a natural balance, and have have the feeling that despite all that she and others do, uh, that it feels like the sun who just shrugs it off and acts like it's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. You're right about that, Deb. Yeah. Putting all of this on a kind of inner theater in my mind, mm-hmm. and just and just wondering, you know, what's happening between the characters. There is also a, um, that the sun represents a certain pleasure in defiance. 
that I think there is also a um a tension in the psyche of the dreamer that has to do with uh, obedience versus disobedience, which I think of course is played out in the home. You have a teenage child who is individuating from the mother, is getting out of the nest, is not respecting the nest, and (laughs) is dismissing the world of the nest and the world of the mother, which goes a bit to what you were saying, Lisa, about the possibility that this has something to do with just the development of her relationship with her son. Robert Bly gives this interesting story towards the end of Iron John. I think it's in Iron John. It may have been one of his lectures where he's talking about the tension between the mother and the teenage son. And in Mm -hmm. one of these stories that uh, parents had divorced, mom is raising the teenage boy, and they're in the kitchen. She comes in and she just walks behind her son and just puts her arms around him and gives him a hug. And the boy has this explosive, shocking reaction where he kind of throws his arms open and, and kind of catapults her back onto her rear end on the floor of the kitchen, and they both turn and look at each other in shock. And the next day she calls her ex-husband and says, I think it's time for him to move in with you. (laughs) That there also is this archetypal activation where Mm. if the son is not helped to, to leave the world of the mother, that this other kind of energy will start stomping around, both in terms of the son stomping around in the nest because he needs to get out of the nest, but also something about the mama bear, you know, running the cub up the pine tree um, (laughs) with her growls as she walks off and and leaves them to fend for themselves, kind of the bloody nosing, so to speak, of the cub. Yeah, yeah. So part of this is the rupture around the nest that, Mm -hmm. that she might learn something from it. It's like, you know, I think my son probably should be disregarding the rules of the nest right now because that's going to prepare him to leave the nest. Uh Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting, Joseph. Yeah. Mm. There's a very, this is a really complex dream. There are Mm -hmm. so many facets to it. Uh, so many areas of uh, of relevance, and we'll have to leave it to our dreamer. And thank you very much for sending the dream. But we leave it to you to parse out what resonates uh, for you at this at this time. 